Well, good morning. And welcome to Holy Family, especially from our visitors from around the diocese. What an exciting day this is for us to have this beautiful gift of Dr. John Bergsmith to present to us just the depths of the scriptures. I, um, I first encountered Dr. Bergsma, probably like most of us, through his writings and his teachings online. And then about three years ago, I had the opportunity to go to a conference that the St. Paul Center puts on for priests. And uh, he was one of the presenters. And we know, especially this time of Lent, where we want to strip away all the extras and just really get to the heart of our Lord, the heart of our faith, the heart of our salvation. And to be around these men who have dedicated their lives to mining the depths of the scriptures so that they can help us encounter the heart of our Heavenly Father that's made present to us so beautifully in the sacred scriptures. So I had, I had a week in the beautiful mountains of West Virginia, but really the mountain of encountering the Lord almost like a transfiguration, as Dr. Petrie, Dr. Hahn, and Dr. Bergsmer unpacked the beautiful gift of the sacred scripture. So I'm excited that this has come through for us today to learn, especially as we get close to Holy Week, those, that central event of our salvation, to, un, to unpack, to encounter, to learn more, and be get some good homily prep for me as well. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> No pressure, Dr. Jordan. But we just, most of us were here for Mass, the greatest prayer we could ever do to offer our life to the Heavenly Father through the sacrifice of the Son. But again, let's just kind of center our minds and our hearts and um, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We give you thanks for this wonderful day, this season of Lent, the gift of our faith. And Lord, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to encounter you through your holy word, through the sacred scriptures. Lord, we know that you desire to reveal yourself to us. And the, one of the ways you've done that is through your scriptures. So as these next few hours unfold and we encounter you in the words of scripture, help us, Lord, to truly encounter you. Let this be a life-changing event. Let us really be conformed more and more to the image of your son as we learn about him through the scriptures, as he reveals your face to us in a more real and more intimate way. Lord, without you, we are nothing, but you have supplied all that we need. Help us, Lord, to say yes to this gift, to this invitation so that we can be conformed more and more to your image and then go out into the world and share this life-saving message with everyone we meet. We ask this, Lord, through your Son's most holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so Dr. John Bergsma, he spent four years as a Dutch Reformed pastor in Grand Rapids, Michigan, before entering the Catholic Church in 2001, while he was getting his PhD in biblical theology with a specialty in Old Testament from the University of Notre Dame. He brings a love and passion for the Catholic faith and sacred scripture. This has made him one of the most sought after Catholic writers and speakers on scripture in America. Twice since he started teaching at Franciscan University, he's been voted the best professor. He has been working closely with Dr. Scott Hahn for almost 20 years, and he is currently the Vice President for Biblical Theology at the St. Paul Center. This center is one of the fastest growing Catholic apostolates in the country, which primary, primarily focuses on helping Catholics better understand the sacred scriptures. He has been married to his wife Dawn for 27 years, and they have eight children. Make sure you grab copies of his amazing books in the narthex. And they include a Catholic introduction to the Bible, the Old Testament, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, revealing the Jewish roots of Christianity. And his most recent book, Jesus and the Old Testament Roots of the Priesthood. It's my honor to welcome to you, Dr. John Bergson. Uh -huh.
Well, it's great to be with you uh, here in sunny Florida. They used to say, when you need it bad, we've got it good. And uh, that's uh, probably, probably true. Uh, although uh, when I left Ohio, we were enjoying uh, some like mid 60s and sunny weather ourselves. So uh, it wasn't that much different. But uh, good to be down here with you. Wonderful be to be with you uh, during Lent. And let's just put these talks this morning in context. So tomorrow is Leitare Sunday. That's the halfway point of Lent. Actually, it's more than halfway. Things are going to go rapidly from here on out. We have just actually one more Sunday of uh, Lent proper. And then the following Sunday is already Holy Week. And then we're into that intense time of following the sequence of our Lord's Passion and then the Holy Triduum. So it's really not too early to focus already on those three uh, momentous days that literally changed world history. And in those days contained the meaning of all created reality. So we're gonna be focusing on this first talk uh, at 10 now on Holy Thursday and the forming of the new covenant in the upper room, which is the Eucharist. And then that giving of himself in a sacramental form in the upper room was confirmed by our Lord a few days later with the giving of himself in a physical sacrifice on the cross. And that's gonna be our second talk this morning, Good Friday through Jewish eyes. And we're going to be drawing on the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Jewish historian Josephus, who was a contemporary of these events, as well as uh, Jewish traditions from the Mishnah, an early codification of Jewish lore, and the, the Old Testament scriptures themselves, to help us better appreciate what was going on in the institution of the Eucharist, and then better appreciate the, uh, the symbolism of the different things, the different realities that our Lord experienced on the way to the cross and how, how they help us to understand what our relationship with Jesus is and what the meaning of the new covenant that we claim to have entered really is. So without further ado, let's jump into Holy Thursday. And uh, I would encourage you, uh, this, this talk, for better or for worse, is highly visual. I'm going to have a lot of text on the screen and some images. So if you're far away, if you're already all the way in the back, please don't be shy. You know, the, uh, the kingdom of heaven is won by those who enter it with violence, as Jesus says. So violently arise from where you are and force your way into these empty seats that are closer so that you can uh, see the screen as best you can. Uh, the presentation will be more enjoyable if you're able to read uh, and, and see the images. So please don't be shy. Uh, find a place. There's a lot of room in this uh, side uh, pew area that's uh, closer to the uh, screen. And, and yeah, there's a front pew here that's uh, not actually reserved. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to be asking... You know, was the Eucharist just a meal to remember Jesus by? That's something a lot of Protestants, but a surprising number of Catholics think as well. Also, do the gospel accounts of the Last Supper contradict one another? That's a claim that many critics of Christianity make. And is the Eucharist rooted in Jewish practices of Jesus' time and what light do the Dead Sea Scrolls shed on the Eucharist? And I'd like to begin with a memory from growing up as a Protestant. My father was a Navy chaplain. We went to many different churches uh, as I was growing up. While we were living in Connecticut when I was about 12 years old, we went to a Baptist church and I got signed up as a junior librarian and I was responsible for keeping the church library open after the Sunday evening service every Sunday from about 5 to 7 p.m. 
And I liked that. It would give me quiet time in the church library, and I would just read books that they had there. And one of the books that I came across was this one called The Gospel Blimp and Other Stories by the evangelical Protestant writer Joseph Bailey. And one of the last little modern parables, it's a collection of you know modern, um, somewhat satirical parables about Christian life that have a a moral or a theological message. And one of the last ones was a little story called How Shall We Remember John? It was only a couple pages long, and the story basically went like this. This medium-sized family had a son named John who was well-loved by his siblings and parents who sadly died in an accident. And the family gathers together and says, how shall we keep John's memory alive? And one of the kids says, well, John loved to eat oatmeal. So they resolve to share a breakfast of oatmeal every morning to remember John. But over the course of time, John's mother says, we should make this uh, fancier. We should make this uh, more solemn. And so she gets little silver bowls for the oatmeal and little silver spoons. And they stop doing it every morning because that makes it too mundane. And they began doing it just uh, four times a year and then three times a year and then just once a year. And, and so it went and becomes more and more ceremonialized. And at the end of the story, the author who's posing as one of John's brothers says, I wish we could just get back to eating together and remembering John, okay? So that's the basic outlines of the story. You see what Bailey's doing with that, right? He's talking about the Eucharist. And his Protestant perspective on the Eucharist was that this was just a meal that Jesus left for us to sit around, eat bread and wine, and remember him. And of course, you know, over the centuries, the church, especially that bad Roman Catholic church, because that's the target he really has in mind, you know, just made all these ceremonies and so on and, and led us astray from just this simple act of remembering Jesus. So that's the view of the Eucharist that many non-Catholics and even a surprising number of those who identify as Catholics have. Of course, you probably all heard about the Gallup poll from last year that showed that 70% of self-identified Catholics don't believe in the real presence. They just think that that the wine are symbols of Jesus' body and blood. So really, the, the very large majority of Christians in America think that the Eucharist was just a common meal that Jesus left us to remember him, okay? Because that's the way, you, that's the, way the gospel accounts come off if you read them from 21st century American eyes. But I ask you a question. Were the gospel authors or Jesus or the apostles 21st century Americans? No, they were first century Jews. So how do these events and how do the gospels look through the eyes of first century Jews? What is going on there? That's what we're going to delve into for the next uh, half hour or so. Okay, so uh, for modern Americans, many details of the Last Supper go unnoticed and unremarked, and again, just a meal to remember Jesus. But for the Jews of the first century, every detail of the Last Supper accounts would have been significant. And paying attention to these details in light of the Dead Sea Scrolls which are the only contemporary Jewish documents we have from this time period. By that, I mean, these are documents that were written down, pen on paper in like uh, AD 30, AD 50, et cetera. These were copied in the time of Jesus, not just composed, but copied physically, okay? And they're the only documents that are physically contemporary uh, with the Gospels that we have. And when we study them and compare them with the Gospels, they enable us to reconstruct the last days of Jesus more vividly. So let me begin with a curious fact that arises when we compare the Gospel accounts. Um, there are some interesting discrepancies that we tend not to notice. 
Let's take the anointing at Bethany when we compare it with uh, John versus the other Gospels. John 12, 1 says that six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, and then the anointing at Bethany ensues. But Mark 14, 1 says it was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and while he was at Bethany, and then he tells the story of Mary's anointing of the Lord at that supper. So why the difference? There's a four-day discrepancy here. John, six days, Mark, two days before the Passover. Is this a mistake? Many critics say it is, and that therefore you can't trust the Gospels because they can't even get their account of Passion Week straight. There's other evidence for a discrepancy. In Mark, we read that on the first day of unleavened bread, when they celebrate the Passover, his disciples said, where shall we prepare for you to eat the Passover? And then they prepare and they eat it. And so this would place the institution of the Eucharist on uh, the Passover itself. However, in John, we read that days later, Pilate brought Jesus out at a place called the pavement. It was the day of preparation of the pa Passover. So according to John, it seems like Passover fell and what we would think of as Holy Saturday. What's going on here? Then let's take another uh, look at Jesus' instructions for the Last Supper. In Luke twenty-two ten, 10, he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house which he enters. Well, what's that all about? A man carrying a jar of water? On first thought, you'd think, well, there's got to be hundreds of guys carrying jars of water around in Jerusalem. Then you think a lot about, think about it a little bit more, and you realize, hmm, actually, maybe not, because carrying water in the ancient world was whose work? It's a woman's work, right? Remember the end of um, uh, the Jungle Book, uh, Disney's animated form, you know? Uh, I must come to kick, take the water, da 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 da. You know, the little girl that Mowgli follows for, uh, falls for. She uh, she has to uh, carry the water, and and she sings this song until she grows up and has a daughter herself, and then she'll send her daughter to get the water. You know. So anyway, so that's that's just a good example of uh, this um, uh, gendered uh, kind of activity, and so. This idea of a guy carrying a jar of water, that's actually kind of unusual. Why would a man be carrying a jar of water in Jerusalem? Let's just put that in the back of our head and we'll come back to it. There's another really odd feature of the gospel accounts of uh, the night of the Last Supper. In Mark 14, 51 and 52, we read that a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Now, what is that? You know, this is just like a cameo appearance by, by a young man. It's like, it's like somebody photobombing the passion narrative or, or like streaking through the set. You know, they're filming the passion of the Christ and, and whoo, oh, who was that? Who was that? Did, was that on film? You know, oh man, we got to edit that out. Do another take. Okay. What is going on with that? By the way, this illustration shows the cloth that the young man's wearing as blue, but linen was naturally white, and that's, that's what it would have been. So man carrying a jar of water, young man wearing nothing but linen, then running away naked. You know, what, are, what do these details mean? Is there some, is there some kind of common thread here these discrepancies of days, different ideas of the Passover, and these other strange things. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to argue that there is a common explanation. We often forget about the third largest branch of Jews in the time of Jesus. The historian Josephus writes, the Jews had three sects of philosophy, the sect of the Essenes, the sect of the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, the doctrines of the Essenes is, Essenes is this, that all things are best ascribed to God. They teach the immortality of souls and esteem them 
excuse me, and esteem that the rewards of righteousness are to be earnestly striven for. And then he goes on to describe the Essenes in, in great length. Now, this figure, Josephus, will mention him a number of times this morning. He was a Jewish statesman, a military leader, and a scholar. He wrote two enormous works, one called The Antiquities of the Jews, which is the history of the Jews from creation all the way to his own day, and then also The Jewish War, which was a 24-hour long account. That's how long it takes to read it, uh, of the, uh, the final battle between the Jews and the Romans that led to the destruction of Jerusalem. So he tells us quite a bit about the, le- the times of Jesus. And uh, according to Josephus, the Essenes were a sect or party of the Jews uh, similar in size to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They do appear in the Gospels, although their name, Essenes, is not used because they didn't call themselves that. They called themselves Israelites. It's a little bit like Mormons. You know, Mormon is an outsider term. We call them Mormons, but they call themselves what? Yeah, Latter-day Saints, absolutely. So you got outsider and insider terminology, right? So the Essenes are something outsiders called them. The gospel writers were sympathetic to the Essenes, and some of the gospel authors had been Essenes. For example, John Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, had uh, grown up in the Essene movement, I would argue. And so uh, uh, you don't see the term used. But the Essenes considered themselves true Israelites and faithful remnants of God's people. They practiced strict observance of God's law and lives of poverty, prayer, and works of charity. Uh, They alone practiced monasticism, and they had a monastery by the shores of the Dead Sea, and the remains of their library are what we know of as the famous Dead Sea Scrolls. So this is a map of Israel, and you see right in the middle, highlighted, there's a uh, dot on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea labeled Qumran. That's the geographical location where this monastery once flourished. And if we zoom in here, we can see a little bit better. This map shows a little bit of the relief. So the Dead Sea scroll, the the Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth, uh, very hot and uh, often humid down there. And that's where they had their monastery. Uh, directly east of Jerusalem. Here are two of the three men who found the scrolls. These are two Bedouin cousins, Muhammad Ethdeeb and Juma Muhammad. This picture was taken in 1947. They have been driving their flocks of sheep and, sheep and goats uh, down the shore of the Dead Sea to get to an oasis, and one of them threw a rock into a cave, heard the shattering of pottery, when they went into the cave to investigate, they pulled out the first of the first three of what were eventually a thousand scrolls that were found in these uh, caves. And within a few years, they made their way into the hands of Western scholars, and it dawned on Western scholarship the significance of what had been found. So these are uh, some pictures of the caves that are in the uh, big limestone bluffs that surround the remains of the monastery. Now, this is a view of the remains of the monastery where you can see the foundations and some of the walls still up to a height of maybe three feet uh, of the different rooms of uh, this common dwelling. One of the unique features of the monastery was the large number of ritual baths. Uh, These are called mikvaot in uh, Jewish tradition. We would think of them as baptismal pools. There were 10 of them in this uh, small site, only a couple acres large. That's the largest concentration of ritual baths in any archeological site from Judaism at this time. Whoever lived there was very concerned about staying ritually clean. And indeed these monks were. The nicest, uh, most dramatic, find among the scrolls was this one, which we call the Great Isaiah Scroll. It was a complete copy of the book of Isaiah in its original language, Hebrew, written 
with quill on parchment, probably around 250 BC, according to carbon dating. So an amazing, complete, in perfect condition, copy of Isaiah from say 200 years before our Lord was born. That is just amazing. To put that in perspective, before the discovery of the scrolls, the oldest complete copy of any Old Testament book that we had in the original language, Hebrew, was only from about 1000 AD. So in one discovery, we move forward 1200 years in terms of our witness to the biblical text. And amazingly, there were no significant differences in the Hebrew between this scroll and what we had had from the Middle Ages, which was an amazing testimony to the fidelity of the Jewish people in copying the sacred scriptures for century upon century. We also found many copies of uh, the document known as the community rule, which, which would be compared to say, the rule of St. Benedict. It gave the laws for their common monastic life as well as the basic theology of their movement. And we will quote several times from this document. This is a fragmentary copy, but we found about 12 copies. They were often uh, missing pieces, but since we found so many copies, we're able to piece together and reconstruct the entire text of uh, the rule that guided their common life. So what did the Essenes have to do with the Last Supper? Well, Essene monks hid their library of scrolls in caves when they saw that they were going to be attacked by the Roman soldiers around the year 70, and they were only rediscovered in 1947, but they have interesting connections with the Gospels. So the mystery of the dating of the Last Supper begins to unravel when we discover that the Essene movement used an older 364-day liturgical calendar. And you see that reflected in their writings. They date the, the year of the Great Flood with 364 days. Likewise, in their documents about the calendar, they figured the months and the years, and they added up to 364. Now, what's the significance of a 364-day liturgical calendar? Well, it's an even number of weeks. It's exactly 52 weeks. So if you have a calendar like this, your feast days always stay on the same day of the week. You know how hours move around, like Christmas moves back and forth along the week. But in their calendar, everything stayed pegged to the same day of the week, and as they got behind the sun, we presume that they just added complete weeks in rather than say leap days, they would wait until it added up and then they'd put in a leap week to keep the weeks on schedule. So they used that and they were a large branch of Judaism. This was an older calendar that had been used by all the Jews prior to the year 150 BC but then the king, uh, the Maccabean king, in about the year 150, changed the calendar, but not all the Jews went along with it. So we're familiar with different liturgical calendars. We know the Orthodox have a different calendar. We've got the Latin Rite calendar, and even within the Latin Rite, we've got extraordinary form and ordinary form, which have different readings and uh, different observations, etc. So on this older calendar, all the feast days stayed on the same day of the week. Interestingly, Passover was always on a Wednesday with the meal celebrated then Tuesday night and possibly without a lamb because they regarded the temple as defiled and therefore they didn't have a place to sacrifice a lamb. Another interesting fact about the Essenes, they often lived in celibate community Josephus says they reject pleasures as an evil, but esteem continence and the conquest over our passions to be virtue. They neglect wedlock, but choose out other persons' children while they are pliable and fit for learning and esteem them to be of their own kindred and form them according to their own manners. So they basically took in orphans and boys from 
the rest of Jewish society and raise them in the monastery, and that's how they got their vocations. And large numbers of Essenes lived celibately in Jerusalem, interestingly, uh, Essene men. Uh, in their documents, they insist that a man may not lie with a woman in the city of the temple, defiling the city of the temple by their uncleanness, because ritually marital relations rendered one unclean, and so they lived in celibacy in the holy city. Uh, also, interestingly, uh, they only wore linen because it was the fabric of the priesthood, and they regarded themselves as a priestly movement, and they lived poverty, and so they would only wear a single garment. Let's throw this into the mix as well. The traditional site of the upper room, which has a strong claim to be historically accurate, is near what we know to be the old Essene gate of old Jerusalem, the gate that the Essenes used to go in and out of the city. Why did they need their own gate? Because they didn't allow you to relieve yourself inside the city of Jerusalem. So when nature called, you had to walk a half mile outside of the city and they had some latrines out there. And so you can imagine for these Essenes that were living in Jerusalem, there was a constant coming and going and that's one of the reasons they had their own gate. So Here's a hypothesis. Did Jesus celebrate his final Passover in the Essene community of Jerusalem, according to the older calendar that they used, which would have been on Tuesday night of Passion Week? If so, we can explain the different dates of the Bethany anointing. Mark would be dating Passion Week by the older calendar that Jesus observed, John by the temple calendar, which was different by a few days. That explains why different days are identified as Passover. Holy Saturday by John, uh, Holy tu Tuesday, if this argument is correct, by uh, the apostles, the, uh, the other uh, gospel writers. The strange man carrying a jar of water. He would have been an Essene doing his own women's work because they lived in celibate community. The young man wearing a single linen garment. Tradition identifies that young man as John Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark. I think that's correct. But this habit of dress, only a single linen garment, that's very characteristic of the Essenes. We later find out in Acts that John Mark's mother owned the house where the upper room was. So that brings us back around to the, to the idea that John Mark's family was probably in the Essene movement and adds additional support to Jesus observing the Passover with them on their uh, calendar. And then the archeology span of the upper room being close to the Essene gate would probably put it in the Essene neighborhood. And then two, having uh, the Last Supper a few days earlier in Passion Week uh, solves a problem that Bible scholars have often wondered about. How is there enough time for all the trials that Jesus go undergoes? He's brought before Annas, he's brought before Caiaphas, He's brought before Herod. He has multiple hearings before Pilate. That's really hard to fit in between 12 hours, between, say, 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. on the evening of Holy Thursday. Uh, it doesn't seem historically plausible, but if we allow a few more days, the chronology is much easier to uh, work out. And then finally, there's two curious references in the Church Fathers to the Last Supper having been held on a Tuesday, and that would also fit with this reconstruction. So, did Jesus celebrate the Last Supper on a Tuesday night with the Essenes, and then die on Friday when the lambs were being sacrificed for the temple Passover on Saturday? Uh, I think this is right, although nothing dogmatic is attached to it. Uh, if so, neither John nor the other Gospels is incorrect, just using different calendars. And I think that John tips his hand when he talks about the Passover on which Jesus dies. He says the Passover of the Judeans. But interestingly, the Essenes never called themselves Judeans. They always called themselves Israelites. And so it's as if John is letting us know that he's dating things according to the mainstream calendar of the temple and uh, not to the so-called Israelite calendar 
that was followed by the Essenes and some other groups of conservative Jews. Well, let's ask this question. Did the Essenes have a Eucharist themselves? I'm going to argue that, in fact, they did. Uh, the historian Josephus describes their lives when he says, they labor till the fifth hour, and afterwards they assemble. And when they clothed themselves in white veils, they then bathe in cold water. After this purification, they meet together in a private room into which no other sect may enter, while they go after a pure manner into the dining room as into a holy temple, and they quietly set themselves down, upon which the baker lays them loaves in order, but a priest says grace before the meal, and it is unlawful for anyone to taste of the food before grace be said. The same priest, when he has dined, says grace again after the meal, and when they begin and when they end, they praise God, after which they lay aside their white garments and labor again until the evening. Hmm, very interesting. Do you know a, a religion where people gather in white robes and dunk themselves in water and afterwards they approach a common meal of bread and wine? Just saying. We read in the community rule, uh, which was their uh, record of their life and theology, uh, they shall eat, pray, and deliberate communally wherever 10 men belonging to the party of the community are gathered. That's the new... And the party of the community is uh, their own terminology for the movement of the Essenes. A priest must always be present. The men shall sit before the priest by rank when the table has been set for eating or the new wine and the new wine ready for drinking. It is the priest sh who shall stretch out his hand first, blessing the first portion of the bread or the new wine. So nobody could touch the food until the priest reached out and gave the blessing and began the meal. Keep that in mind when we move to the institution narrative in Luke. They even had a form of excommunication. The community rule says, these are the rules by which cases are to be decided at a community inquiry. If there be found among them a man who has lied about money and done so knowingly, they shall bar him from the pure meals of the many for one year. That is, he's excommunicated from their Eucharist. Notice what, how they call their, their, uh, uh, their ritual meal. It's the pure meal of the many, okay? Keep that in mind. That term many is one of the, the references that they would use to their own uh, group, their own community. All right. This meal that they celebrated was actually an anticipation of when the Messiah would come because when he came, they believed they would share this meal with him. And until he came, they performed the meal waiting for him. Then the Messiah of Israel may enter, they say about the end times, and the heads of the thousands of Israel are to sit before him by rank. When they gather at the communal table, none may reach for the first portion of the bread or the wine before the priest, for he shall bless the first portion of the bread and the wine, reaching for the bread first. Afterward, the Messiah of Israel shall reach for the bread. Finally, each member of the whole congregation by rank. You see, they believed in two Messiahs, a priestly Messiah and a royal Messiah. The priestly Messiah is here called the priest. And then the kingly Messiah, it, you know, uh, will partake of the meal secondly. Uh, so that, that is interesting in itself. Um, Josephus says, when they begin and when they end the meal, they praise God as he that bestows the, their food upon them. We have their hymn book among the Dead Sea Scrolls, which they used to sing and praise God at the beginning and the end of their meals. All the hymns begin, I give thanks to you, O Lord, for something. You have redeemed my soul from the pit. I give thanks to you, O Lord, for you have become my wall of strength. I give thanks to you, O Lord, for you have made my face to shine by your covenant. It's all written in Hebrew, but if you translate it into Greek, all these hymns would begin with the Greek word, Eucharisteo, I praise you, or I thank you, O God, from which, of course, we get the word Eucharist. So, 
The Essenes had a communal meal that anticipated the meal with the Messiah in the final age. The priest officiated at the meal. The meal was bread and wine. One had to be a member of the new covenant community to take the meal. This is something that we didn't get into yet, but they called themselves the community of the new covenant because they thought they had entered into the new covenant already. Sinning against the community meant loss of access to the meal. The meal began and ended with uh, Thanksgiving Psalms that began with, I thank you, O Lord. So this is a photo that we recovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls. It had to be colorized, but uh, apparently it's a selfie of them uh, celebrating their common meal. Now let's move to the Gospels. Uh, Luke 22 says, He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after supper, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now for, G for the disciples, some of whom had been raised in Essenism, they would recognize this as the long-awaited meal of bread and wine with Messiah. And notice that Jesus gives thanks and blesses the bread and wine first, and that's a priestly act. Nobody else could touch it until the priest has done it. That was the mindset in this culture. It's not simply, uh, you know, a family, uh, uh, you know, supper. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, etc. This line, do this in remembrance of me, you can literally translate this, do this as my memorial offering, okay? Because the word for remembrance used in the Greek is the same word used for the memorial offering in the temple. The memorial offering was an offering of grain that renewed the covenant, does it make sense to think of the Eucharist as a grain offering that renews the covenant? I would argue, yes. And notice, the new covenant is the cup consisting of my blood. This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Now, in Latin, new covenant is translated New Testament. If you go out on the streets of Jacksonville and ask people what the New Testament is, they're going to say it's the second part of the Bible. It's those 27 books, whatever, at the end. That's not the New Covenant. Those are the books about the New Covenant. The New Covenant is actually the Eucharist. The New Covenant in my blood. That means consisting of my blood and also by extension, his body. We have to reorient the way we think about Christianity. There's many Christians in America who consider themselves New Testament Christians, but all they do is read the books of the New Testament, but they never actually participate in the Eucharist. And that would be like a person who goes to the Chinese restaurant, reads the whole menu, and never orders General Tso's chicken. What is the point? The meal where you experience Christ in his sacramental form, that is the new covenant toward which all human history was building. This is the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy from 700 years earlier. In Matthew, we read our Lord's words, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Many people wonder, why does he use the word many? Why doesn't he just say all? Well, it's because this term many was used for the community of people who were waiting for the Messiah. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we read, if the novice does proceed in joining the party of the Yachad, he must not touch the pure food of the many, that was their, uh, their proto-Eucharist, if you will, before they have examined him as to his spiritual fitness and his works, etc. In other words, there was a catechumenate period before you could join the community. So this term many was a typical way of referring uh, to, uh, uh, to their sect. 
Now, in Luke, we read that a dispute arose the, among the disciples about who was to be regarded as the greatest. The explanation for that is the disciples were conditioned that at these solemn meals, you had to sit by rank. We read in the Dead Sea Scrolls about how when the Messiah comes and they celebrate the meal of bread and wine with him, everybody has to sit by rank. And that's probably why this argument arose among the disciples. It wasn't just that they were vain, but they felt like this was what was appropriate to the occasion. And then our Lord says, you are those who have continued with me in my trials. I covenant to you as my father covenanted to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's literally translated from the Greek. None of the current translations read covenant as the verb there, but that's literally what it is. And there's echoes here of David the king, whose kingdom was established by a covenant from God in 2 Samuel 7. And the apostles are being given a, priest, a princely status in the kingdom, which continues to the present day, which we see in our bishops. That's why a bishop wears a martyr. Uh, excuse me, wears a martyr. <laughs> Where's a mitre, okay? He might become a martyr, uh, but uh, he wears a mitre, which is an, an ancient crown worn by royalty. Why? Because he's a successor of the apostles who were appointed as princes of the kingdom at the Last Supper uh, as part of this covenant. So summing up, the Last Supper is no mere memorial meal as non-Catholics sometimes think. The disciples would have understood the priestly and messianic significance of Jesus' actions because the disciples had a concept of a bread and wine meal with the Messiah in the end times. The Eucharist is a covenant meal, making us God's family and establishing us as God's kingdom. And the Eucharist, of course, also goes beyond anything the Essenes imagined. Yes, they had a meal of bread and wine but they did not foresee that the Messiah himself would give his body as a meal. So just very quickly, getting back to that parable that we started with, is the Eucharist nothing other than a meal to remember John? You know, Jesus' favorite food was bread and wine, so let's gather every now and again and share his favorite meal and think about Jesus. I'm sorry, that's so American, but so not Jewish. Let's think of the differences. In this parable, John's family wasn't building on a long tradition of sacred meals in their culture with their oatmeal meal for John, but Jesus was building on a long tradition of sacred meals in Judaism. John's parents in the parable weren't claiming to establish a new covenant between God and all humanity through this meal of oatmeal. Okay? You see the difference? <laughs> But Jesus was claiming to establish a whole new relationship between God and humanity in this meal. None of the meal actions of John's family in the parable were intended or were understood to be either priestly or liturgical, but Jesus' actions definitely would have been in the Jewish culture of his day. John's family wasn't culturally formed to expect to celebrate a meal of oatmeal with the Messiah at the end of time, but the apostles were expecting a meal of bread and wine with the Messiah at the end of time. John's parents didn't claim to be fulfilling ancient prophecies by celebrating a meal of oatmeal, but Jesus was claiming to, to fulfill prophecies 700 years old from the prophet Jeremiah when he established a new covenant meal. So I hope that we can appreciate how different the Eucharist is from just gathering together to think about somebody as we eat their favorite food. Talk a little bit about some resources that are available if you want to go deeper on this. We've got a a uh, short CD, well, it's really three hours long. I don't know if that's short by your standards. A three-hour CD called The Dead Sea Scrolls for Catholics. A 25-hour CD set called The Dead Sea Scrolls and the Jewish Roots of the Church, if you want to go really in-depth. 
and uh, my recent book, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I will be leading a pilgrimage uh, this year, Lord willing, keep your fingers crossed, and uh, hopefully COVID abates uh, July 18th uh, through 28th. Uh, this year. You can check it out at johnbergsma.com. Let's conclude in prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Eucharist. Help us to understand and appreciate Holy Thursday and the institution of the Eucharist uh, more fully. Um, help us always to treasure your sacramental presence through which you come to us and make that family bond with us that we call the new covenant. We ask all this through Christ our Lord and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. I'd like to call up Ken Baldwin uh, to talk to us a little bit about uh, the mission of the St. Paul Center with which I, I work with uh, St. Uh, St. Scott Hahn. Not yet. <laughs> Has not been canonized yet. But with whom I work. Uh, yeah. Getting the mic language mumbled up here. I uh, work with uh, Dr. Hahn um, uh, in uh, guiding the center, and it's a wonderful apostolate uh, for the extension of biblical knowledge in the church. Thank you so much, John. God bless you. What a joy, and I can't wait for your second talk. I just wanted to take a brief moment to just say it's great to see you all again. We were here with Dr. Hahn back in 2019, which does feel like 100 years ago. That was pre-COVID. And I remember um, grabbing Jimmy John sandwiches from the crossroad as we hightailed it out of here. But, you know, I see so many dear friends. I see Doug here who helped bring the Break of the Bread newsletter to local prison. And uh, that's what you'll find here in this folder. The St. Paul Center exists to set Catholics on fire for their faith, to help them go deeper in their understanding of Scripture. And we have three core outreaches to laity. How many of you are doing the Parousia Bible and Mass right now for Lent? Great. It's great to see some hands. We have this Parousia Bible and Mass study going on right now. We have over 100,000 Catholics from around the world going two lessons a week, going deeper into the Bible, Mass, Scripture, and uh, it's just building each and every episode. And uh, it's a huge part of our outreach to help Catholics connect the dots be between Scripture and their faith. And then we're so excited. Father Keegan is bringing 12 of his classmates as they celebrate their five-year anniversary of being ordained priest with us to Ogle Bay Resort. We're going to have over 230 priests join us. We just had a huge priest retreat in January. And why does that matter? Why is that important? Because our priests are struggling with the many things that are going on in this world. And so to be able to come together, serve and support them, and let them and, and bring together John Birch, Ms. Scott Hahn, Dr. Lawrence Feigenwald, just some great, great scripture scholars that they can really just enjoy being priests. We can honor them and thank them for all they do for us, bringing us the Eucharist. And then when they come back, they're so excited to give you the best homilies ever. Amen? And we also do a lot to help the next generation of scholars and seminarians. We're creating the best textbooks for seminaries. So I want to draw your attention to these folders because each and every one of you can support our work right now. And we're going to be raffling off with your uh, commitment cards, some goodies here after John's second talk. But I just want to tell you that uh, we have um, the Mass Road publishing arm, and we're so excited to have just published John's latest book, Jesus and the Old Testament Roots of the Priesthood, which for every Catholic is such an important book to read because it helps you see how God's plans for the priesthood as we know it today were so, from the beginning of time, from the Old Testament moving forward. I see Jeanette and Phil Gitto here, whose son Beckett, if you went to our podcast this morning, is helping produce every day the, sun, the, the mass readings. And our team is growing. We've gone from five people to over 30. And with our digital outreach, we have the mobile app now that allows you to every day get a great podcast, to do and stream all these great studies that are just incredible, just to go deeper with Scripture. And when you're able to make a monthly commitment, you can download this mobile app from your iPhone, from your Android, and 
allows you to just stream and access these studies just so much easier. And so that's been really exciting for us to just, again, make our work as accessible as possible. So I want to give you a few minutes as you uh, uh, fill out your commitment card, which will allow us to stay in touch. Uh, I did just want to say, speaking of Jeanette Gitto, we will be back here in June for the Emergency Pregnancy Services Breakfast. So important. The right to life is so important. And so we're so excited to have Scott and Kimberly Hahn come here to Jacksonville in June for that breakfast. And uh, again, we hope to be back here quite often. And uh, it seems like we will be. It's, it's just great to be here with you. And um, as you kind of now fill out your cards with your folders, if you need a folder, our team in the back, Lucy and Dan have been so helpful, they can bring you a folder if you need one. But as you're looking at your commitment card and you want to consider a monthly donation of any amount, we're so grateful. And then this allows us to stay in touch with you. Uh, we had this, you know, this last year with COVID, everything was canceled, you know, and we're praying John can do the pilgrimage in July. But we do this priest conference in Wheeling, West Virginia, because it's not far from where our headquarters are in Steubenville, Ohio. Now, West Virginia's governor is um, in the hospitality industry. And so West Virginia was like the only place in the country you could have conferences still this summer. And so praise the Lord, we were still able to have our July priest conference. It was the only thing literally happening that nationally could bring together priests. And it was just so special. And then we moved the priest conference in January because we had to go to two now. We moved it to Austin, Texas. And a great Catholic owns this hotel, and so he made us some great deals. And his hotel staff sent him an email, and they said, Rob, we can't thank you for having these men here. The entire staff felt like we were on holy ground. And when Father David was sharing about how it was kind of like being in the transfiguration, just to come together and see all these holy men of God, it's just so powerful. So we're looking next year to go to three priest conferences because they keep filling up. And uh, so it's so exciting. So I'll give you now a brief moment to fill out your cards and Dan and Luce will be around to collect them. And then we'll take a two minute break and then John will start with his second talk, which is gonna be fantastic. And you know, from um, understanding scriptures, what John just did in that first talk was so huge because um, there are those that are very critical of scripture. What he just addressed was an issue that has come up, especially in the highest academic circles. And so what he's doing to help renew wonder with scripture and to help remind Catholics that it is the word of God and to draw us closer is so powerful. So John, I thank you again for all you do. And we'll give you this time now to fill up the cards. And then what we're going to do is after the second talk, we're going to be raffling off some great resources that you'll find in the back. And uh, just, again, so grateful to see you all here. And uh, it's just great to be back here in Jacksonville. God bless you.
still got a core of 30 parish. And it's still got a core of 30 parish. And it's still got a core of 30 parish. And it's still got a core of 30 parish. And it's still got a core of 30 parish. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're going to gather back together again for talk number two. The only thing better than one talk by Dr. Bergsma is two. After the second talk, we will do a raffle, and then Dr. Bergsma will be out in the North X to sign the books you just bought. So that'll be great. All right, I'd like to reintroduce Dr. John Bergsma. All right, it's fantastic. Um, we're going to get even more intense now in this second talk as, as we look at Good Friday, um, which kind of completes the meaning of what we've begun, you know, the giving of our Lord uh, in the form of the sacrament on Holy Thursday. And now we're going to look at his self-giving on the cross. So... Was the cross just the death of a teacher, or is there actually wedding imagery during the most unjust execution in world history? Are there also really signs of Christ's priesthood during his death? And what's the connection of our Lord's crucifixion with the temple? And what makes Jesus' death a liturgical sacrifice rather than simply an execution? These are some of the questions we're going to address as we meditate on the events of Good Friday. You know, the evangelist John, who gives us his gospel, portrays Jesus as an eschatological bridegroom and priest. That word eschatological means end times. Okay, so an end times bridegroom and priest at the Passion. But he prepares us for this throughout his gospel, especially in these incidents, the wedding at Cana, the woman at the well, and the anointing at Bethany. And you might notice these are gospel readings that come up in the early part of the church year and during Lent uh, for good reason. So let's look, for example, at the wedding at Cana. And this event is so powerful. There's so much symbolism in all, the, in all the things that Jesus does at this wedding. But we can't go into that all this morning. Let's just focus on one idea. Have we ever thought about whose role Jesus fulfills at the Cana wedding? His mother comes and tells him they have no wine. And, of course, we have that discussion between our Lord and his mother about whether they really want to do a miracle here. And uh, then <clears throat> uh, Our Lady just tells the servants to do whatever Jesus says, and he has them fill those jars full of water, and then he transforms it to wine and tells them to take it out and bring it to the steward of the feast. And... The steward of the feast tastes it, calls the bridegroom over. Why does he call the bridegroom over? That's the point. Yeah? Why does the steward of the feast call the bridegroom? It's because it was the bridegroom's responsibility to provide wine for the wedding. This was Jewish culture of the day. 
we know how weddings work in American culture. You know, the father of the bride pays for the wedding. The father of the groom pays for the rehearsal dinner. And then there's accepted roles for the maid of honor and the best man who are supposed to offer toasts. And we, we have this kind of expectation of who's going to do what at uh, our weddings. Well, in ancient Judaism, they had the expectation that the man getting married would bring the wine. So again, let's ask this question. Whose job then did Jesus do at the wedding at Cana? The bridegroom's. Oh, now let's ask another question. Did he do the job well or did he do it poorly? Well, I would say, you know, those jars carried 20 to 30 gallons a piece. There were six of them. So we're talking maybe 180 gallons of fine French cabriolet. I would say that's very well. I think that Jesus probably got a lot of invitations to weddings after that event. Everybody in northern Israel is like, hey, you remember that rabbi from Nazareth? Make sure he goes down on the list. You see what he did at that at cousin Jody's wedding? All right. So Jesus does the role of the bridegroom at the wedding at Cana. He does it very well. And that reveals him as the divine bridegroom. And remember that in Judaism, a husband is obliged to bring joy to his wife. Based on this verse in the Torah, when a man is newly married, he shall be free at home one year to gladden his wife whom he has married. And it's a very vigorous term in Hebrew here. It's the intensive verb. Uh, to make his wife glad whom he has married. And derive, the uh, rabbis derived from that the general principle that a husband is obliged to bring joy to his wife. And let's add the fact that, according to the scriptures, wine gladdens the heart of man. It's a, a similar verb here to the command in the law to make one's wife glad. And so Jesus at the wedding at Cana reveals himself as the divine bridegroom come to bring joy to his bride. And who is his bride? Why, it's Israel, or more generally, God's people that he has come to bring joy to. And then a few chapters later, we see our Lord having this conversation with a woman at the well. Uh, this woman is a Samaritan woman. Let us recall that the Samaritans were the last descendants of northern Israel. Only one prophet was sent to northern Israel and uh, of the writing prophets whose books we have. And that prophet was Hosea. I don't know if you noticed, but for Mass this morning, our opening hymn was taken from uh, the book of Hosea, and it was about God calling out and calling to his people as a bride, uh, God being the bridegroom. And that's a very strong theme in the book of Hosea, especially Hosea chapter 2, where God describes himself as the bridegroom come to call bride Israel back to himself. Well, here is this Samaritan woman who is a symbol of the people of Israel. She's the uh, part of the last descendants of those northern tribes of Israel. And so what we have in John 4 is what we call a classic betrothal scene where guy meets girl at a well. This happens a lot in the Bible. It's almost a cliche. It's like watching rom-coms, you know? There's certain cliches in rom-coms, you know? I've, watched every Jane Austen movie, every, uh, everything with Meg Ryan, everything with Sandra Bullock, because my, my wife loves romantic comedies. And so on the weekends, you know, she, she puts these on and I watch them with her. But there's these certain cliches, these certain things that happen, you know, like they go on a date and somebody's ice cream cone drops, you know, and then they laugh. That, that's so funny that the 
ice cream fell on the ground for some reason, you know, but then you know that they're into each other if they're laughing at something like that. So anyway, uh, so there's these cliches that you get in these romantic stories. Well, a biblical cliche is guy meets girl at well, right? That first happened in Genesis 24, where Abraham's servant courted Rebecca on behalf of Isaac uh, at a well. And then a few chapters later, Isaac's son Jacob uh, uh, is courting Rachel at a well in Genesis 29. And several chapters later, we find Moses meeting his wife Zipporah at a well in Exodus 2. And so this is just something that we come to expect. And when so Jesus is sitting at the well and this woman comes, it, it evokes all of these recollections of the Old Testament of, you know, guy meets girl at a well. But it's not a natural marriage. Jesus is the divine bridegroom, and he's not calling just this woman. He's calling all of the Samaritans uh, to himself because the Samaritan people are the Israelites whose bride is the Lord, and Jesus is the Lord God right there in human flesh. It fulfills what was said in Hosea 2. I will allure her. I will speak tenderly to her. You will call me my husband. I will betroth you to me forever. Well, that's not the only uh, uh, betrothal uh, image that we get in the book of John, the Gospel of John. We move several chapters forward and we have another very deep, richly symbolic incident at Bethany when Mary of Bethany brings a pound of pure nard to anoint uh, the feet and the head of Jesus. Now it's interesting that nard is only mentioned in one book of the Old Testament. And that's the Song of Songs, this collection of romantic poetry. And there, nard is a romantic perfume that Solomon and his bride use. In fact, in the Song of Songs, it says, While the king reclined on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. And here is Jesus reclining on the couch as this nard that Mary has brought uh, fills the whole house with fragrance. Jesus goes on to say, let her keep it for my burial, which is very interesting. He's saying, let her keep the rest of the nard for the time when he's buried, which connects this romantic uh, perfume or this romantic cologne, if you will, to Jesus's burial. Now, what would marriage and romance have to do with Jesus being buried? Let's just put that question in the back of our minds and we'll bring it up again when we get to the burial of Jesus in the gospel account. We're now ready to start moving through the description of our Lord's passion in John 19 and 20. And we're going to see these marriage images and also some priestly images as we do that. So we begin at the beginning of John 19, and we find that the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. It's interesting, the custom among the, uh, among the uh, royal house of Israel was to wear a wedding crown on the day of the wedding. And this crown was not made of metal, but of foliage. And so... The Song of Songs, chapter 311, says, Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. This crown was supposed to be of uh, vines and flowers uh, to bespeak the joy of the occasion of the royal wedding. But look at the nuptial crown that we humanity give to our divine bridegroom. We give him thorns. That's ironic because where did thorns come from anyway? Thorns are one of the few things in the cosmos that we human beings can claim as coming from us. Because had it not been for us, there would be no thorns. Remember in Genesis 3, it was the result of Adam's sin 
that thorns came on the world. So we take what is particularly ours, thorns, which are a symbol of the result of sin, and that's what we put on the head of our divine bridegroom. Then we notice a few verses later that Jesus' tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. How interesting, because there's only one such garment that we know of in the ancient world that was made seamlessly, and that was the garment of the high priest. Josephus, our historian friend, writes, the high priest is indeed adorned with a vestment of a blue color. This also is a long robe reaching to his feet. Now this vesture was not composed of two pieces, nor was it sewn together upon the shoulders and the sides, but it was one long vestment so woven as to have an aperture for the neck. So this seamless robe of Christ taken from him at the cross is a sign of his true high priesthood. And then, uh, poignantly and ironically, our Lord's tunic is not torn even by the soldiers. They say, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. They unwittingly fulfill the Old Testament law, which commanded in Leviticus 21.10, that the priest who is chief among his brethren, in other words, the high priest, shall not tear his clothes. So Jesus, his clothing is not torn, but we can't avoid remembering from the other gospels what the reigning high priest at this time did when Jesus identified himself as the Messiah, the high priest Caiaphas tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. Why do we still need witnesses? You now have heard his blasphemy. That's so ironic because the high priest is breaking divine law when he tears his garments. Moses had said the high priest should never do such a thing. So in the very act of condemning Jesus, the high priest is breaking the very divine law that he's claiming to uphold. Yet Jesus on the cross, his high priestly garment, not even torn by Gentile Roman soldiers. Then we have this poignant scene. Standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. Let's just ponder this event for a moment. When in real life do you ever have to tell a woman that she has a son? And when in real life do you ever have to identify who the mother is for a little boy? Let me suggest to you, I've witnessed this five times myself. <laughs> this happens in the birthing room. This happens in the delivery room. Okay, because of course, being an ancient society, they don't have ultrasounds. They don't know the gender of the child before he's born but the baby comes out and then you know, oh, it's a son. And then you announce to the mother, you have a son. Or you wash the baby up and wrap him in a blanket and you bring him to the mother and says, you say, look, you have a baby boy. And you put the baby on the mother's breast and maybe he suckles for the first time. And maybe you coo to the child and you say, look, it's your mama, it's your mama. Right? So this language, look, your mother, look, your son, it's the language of the delivery room. It's the language of birth. And this has been perceived by the Catholic spiritual tradition and many Catholic spiritual writers who speak of St. John as the first child of the new Adam and the new Eve, uh, the first spiritual child of the Blessed Mother. And that fulfills a prophecy from Isaiah 67, which speaks of daughter Zion and says, before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she was delivered of her son. The labor and the pain that's being spoken of here, I would argue spiritually, 
mystically is the suffering that the Blessed Mother is about to endure watching Jesus expire. But even before she undergoes that kind of co-suffering with her son, Jesus Christ, she, so to speak, gives birth spiritually to a spiritual son, the Apostle John, who can be thought of as the first son of the church. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. Only twice in the Gospel of John does Jesus indicate that he's thirsty. The earlier time was in John 4, the woman at the well. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. But if you look for the biblical roots of the symbolism of what Jesus is doing, it goes all the way back to the first time that guy met girl at well in the Bible, which was in Genesis 24, when Abraham's servant goes to court Rebecca on behalf of Isaac, and Abraham's servant strikes a deal with God in prayer, and he prays to God and says, let the maiden to whom I shall say, Pray, let down your jar that I may drink, and you shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one. So uh, Abraham's servant is going to find a wife for Isaac, and he asks God for a sign. He's going to ask for a drink, and the girl that responds generously, because for a young woman to volunteer, not only to give a drink to a stranger, but to water all his camels? I mean, the guy probably has a half a dozen camels. They can drink like 30 gallons at a time if you study camels, you know? So this poor girl is volunteering to drink, to, to draw up like 200 gallons of water from this well, okay? So not only is she generous, but she's probably also pretty physically fit, you know, to volunteer this to a complete stranger. So. She's physically fit, she's generous, she's virtuous. These are great qualities in a wife. This is uh, what uh, Abraham's servant is probably thinking. But in the biblical tradition, this is important because then this is the, this is the key. The request for a drink is the cue to reveal who the bride will be. So there on the cross, Jesus says, I thirst. And many of the saints have understood the dynamic of what's going on. Like St. Teresa of Calcutta, who is not a trained exegete or a biblical scholar, but through the grace of the Holy Spirit, she intuited that Jesus is thirsting for our love. And he's asking to see who's going to respond generously. Just like Abraham's servant was looking for the girl who would respond generously to this request for a drink. So how do we do respond? Do we as humanity respond generously to the request for a drink from our divine bridegroom? And let me throw another thing in here. According to very ancient Jewish wedding practices, the wedding of a bride and groom concluded with the two, the new couple, drinking from a common cup of wine. We don't know if that tradition goes all the way back to the first century, but if it did, this would add a very interesting dynamic to understanding what is going on with our Lord on the cross. But this is the wine that we give to our divine bridegroom. He asks for a drink, and a bowl full of soured wine stood there. The word in Greek is oxos. It's uh, like wine vinegar wine that's been allowed to go too long. It still had some alcohol in it, so it was sold in the marketplace for pennies, and the poorest of the poor would buy it just to get a little bit intoxicated and to get some relief from their pains and their worries for a little while before they woke up and had to start it all over on another day. So this is the cheapest swill that you can get. It's the absolute cheapest beer in the whole store, so to speak the stuff that folks with no money just buy because that's all they can afford. And this is what they put on a sponge uh, full of the soured wine and held it up to his mouth. Brothers and sisters, there is a 
dramatic contrast in the Gospel of John. The wedding at Cana and the cross are bookends to this Gospel. They are the only two events in this Gospel where the Blessed Mother shows up. They're the only two events in the Gospel where Jesus provides liquid from himself, okay? They are the only two events in the gospel where wine shows up, right? And they are meant to be understood in relationship to one another. So let's think this through. At the wedding of Cana, Jesus shows himself to be the divine bridegroom who in response to our thirst does what? 180 gallons of fine French cabriolet. Okay? Just an enormous amount of generosity to quench our thirst for love. At the cross, the shoe is on the other foot. He's now thirsty, and humanity needs to provide drink for him. What do we give him? A sponge full of the cheapest swill you can possibly buy. Wine vinegar. That's the disparity between God's love for us and our feeble response. But of course, if we open ourselves to Christ's love, then as Romans 5, 5 says, he will fill our hearts with God's love through the Holy Spirit, and we can give back to Christ a drink of love that's worthy of him as our bridegroom. So they put the sponge full of soured wine and hyssop and held it to his mouth. Remember, Jesus gave the best wine when we were thirsty. And remember also that at the Last Supper, he said, I'm not going to drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. As ironic as it seems, when Jesus drinks the fruit of the vine at the cross, he is ushering in the kingdom of God. Jesus, therefore, when he had taken the soured wine, said, It is consummated. And bowing his head, he gave up the ghost. I'm quoting from the Dewey Rames here because it uses consummated. But it does so with good reason. Because the Greek of the Gospel of John uses the word tetelestai, which has the almost the identical range of meaning as the Latin word consummatum, including the reference and the connotations of marriage. So the divine marriage of our Lord is completed at the cross, and one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. St. Augustine, commenting on this, notes the kind of marital consummation imagery here. Uh, other church fathers note that in the blood and the water coming forth from the side of Christ, that's like a birth when blood and water come forth from the womb. It reminds us of Adam who gave birth, so to speak, from e of Eve, his bride, from his very side, as God the Father opened the side of Adam and brought forth Eve uh, from Adam's rib. However, the imagery that contemporaries of Jesus and the early Jewish readers of the Gospel of John first would have caught would have actually been the connection with the flow of bloody water from the temple during Passover. Remember that Jesus in the Gospel of John is being put on the cross and executed on the afternoon before Passover, which according to John was the next day, going by the temple calendar. And already on Friday afternoon, they began to sacrifice the lambs in the temple. And they had to slaughter up to a quarter of a million lambs for the up to two million pilgrims that swelled the population of Jerusalem during the Passover holiday. And that slaughtering of a quarter of a million lambs uh, led to an enormous amount of blood in the temple courts, which they washed down drains using buckets of water that they had gathered from the pool of Siloam, 
which occurs in the Gospel of John earlier in John chapter 9. That's where the man born blind from birth is healed. There's a lot of different connections going on there. But uh, when, when John writes about the flow of blood and water coming forth from the side of Christ, the early Jewish readers of the Gospel would have immediately made the connection to the flow of bloody water coming from the side of the temple during Passover and other uh, high holidays. This is an artist's uh, representation of how this would have looked. There looked like there were drains in the floor of the temple that led to a great uh, exhaust drain that came out of the side of the Temple Mount and then flowed down uh, the, the, uh, the Temple Mount into the Kidron Valley where it became part of the uh, Kidron Brook which flowed eventually down to the Dead Sea. And so this image of bloody water coming forth from the temple, which nonetheless was life-giving because it was, the it was the sign of the sacrifices which brought forgiveness and, and uh, new life to the people of Israel, uh, that's an image that harks all the way back to the first temple in salvation history, which was actually the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was the first sanctuary, the first place of worship. And a river flowed out of Eden that watered the whole earth. And John, uh, later in life, will have the great vision. That's the basis of the book of Revelation. And at the end of Revelation, he's in heaven and he sees a new uh, Jerusalem. And out of the new Jerusalem flows a river of the water of life. And also the tree of life is there. It's this image of return to Eden. These are also sacramental images, as we're going to discuss shortly. We're talking about the Gospel of John, and water in the Gospel of John is always tied to baptism, and blood in the Gospel of John is always tied to the Eucharist. So how are we spiritually reborn? We've said that the blood and water from the side of Christ is the sign of birth, but how is it that the spiritual children of Christ are actually reborn. Isn't it through the waters of baptism? And St. Augustine speaks of the piercing of Christ's side and the blood and the water as, as marital uh, union. How is it that we consummate our union with Christ who is our spiritual spouse? Is it not through the Eucharist? And so this blood and water that comes forth from the side of Christ it is the river of life flowing out from the temple. Jesus' body is the new temple. That's what uh, John means in John 2.21, where he says that Jesus spoke of the temple of his body. If you close your eyes a minute, I want to do a little uh, imaginary experiment with you. Close your eyes and think of Calvary. See Jesus on the cross. <laughs> Excuse me. I always sneeze in sets of three, but sometimes uh, heretical sets of four. <laughs> sets of three are for the Holy Trinity. But then there's always that <coughs> awkward additional sneeze. Anyway, uh, let's close our eyes and let's think of Jesus on the cross and let's imagine that flow of blood and water from his side. Now, zoom out, you know, as if this is Google Maps, and we're going up into the air, and we're looking at Calvary get smaller below us, and see that river of water and blood flow down to the south into Africa, see it flow east into Asia, see it flow north and west into Europe and across the Atlantic into the New World. Uh, now roll the centuries forward through the patristic era and the medieval period and into the modern period and the contemporary period. And then here we are in Florida at the north, the southeast end of this continent of North America. And is that river of blood and water still flowing? Indeed it is. It flowed for us a couple hours ago. It flows at this altar. It flows from that font. 
Okay? Every Catholic church is a new Eden that flows with the river of life. Every Catholic church is a new Calvary, which has the body of Christ, which flows with blood and water. The blood is the Eucharistic fruit of the tree of life from which we can eat for and live forever. And the water is the river of life in which we can bathe and live forever. And then Nicodemus came at the cross who had come to him by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. Myrrh and aloes were expensive perfumes like, you know, uh, Stetson or One by Dolce & Gabbana or, uh, you know, Elizabeth Taylor, White Diamonds or whatever, Chanel Number no. 5, whatever you have. These are, these are very expensive perfumes sold by the ounce, okay? You know, you go to the airport and they have these duty-free shops where... You know, you can buy these expensive, you know, European fragrances for $50, $75, $100, $150 for, uh, you know, per ounce. So that's the comparison here. And how much does Nicodemus bring? Does he bring five ounces? Does he bring five, uh, uh, you know, 100 ounces? No, he brings 100 pounds. Okay. This is like Chanel number no. five in the 20 gallon keg. This incredibly expensive uh, fragrance that was used for weddings and funerals and other great life occasions. This was probably Nicodemus's family estate's entire collection that was meant to last for every relative's wedding and funeral for a couple of generations into the future and he brings the whole stash and he pours it out on the body of Christ and this has priestly imagery in it because myrrh was the primary scent used for anointing the high priest but then it was myrrh and aloes and myrrh and aloes are only mentioned in the Old Testament in romantic marital contexts like in Proverbs 7, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes. Psalm 45, the royal wedding saw. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes. Um, <clears throat> also the song of songs. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with the choicest fruits. Henna with nard, nard and saffron, myrrh and aloes. So this is a fragrance fit for a royal wedding being poured on the body of Christ, and then they wrap him with linen, which is the clothing of the high priest. The Levitical laws say that the high priest shall put on the holy linen coat. He shall have the linen breeches on his body, be girded with the linen girdle, and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. So they put these linen garments on him, fit for a high priest with these... Uh, uh, a wedding perfumes fit for a king. And then in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and the garden was a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. So therefore, it is a virginal tomb in keeping with the law, which commanded that the high priest shall take a wife in her virginity, a virgin of his own people, in keeping with the Song of Songs, where the bride is described as a garden locked, a garden locked, a fountain sealed. And so just as Jesus took flesh in the virginal womb of the Blessed Mother, at his death, his flesh is placed in the virginal tomb of the Holy Sepulcher. The womb of the Mother gives birth to Christ at Christmas. The womb of the Holy Sepulcher gives birth to Christ at Easter. And lest you think I'm just making a comparison based on womb and tomb in English, let me point out that in the scriptures themselves, there is this constant theme of the comparison of the womb of the mother with the womb of Mother Earth. So Job says, naked I came forth from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. Is he actually going to return to his mother's womb? No, he's going to be placed in a grave in the ground. 
but that return to the grave is likened to being a return to the womb of the mother. Ecclesiastes said, he came from his mother's womb. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall return naked as he came. Psalm 139 says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I was made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. See how the womb is compared to the depths of the earth. Jeremiah says, my mother should have been my grave, her womb forever great, comparing the womb again to the tomb. So the holy sepulcher is also a sign of the blessed mother, and the blessed mother is a sign of the church, who is mother and bride. So when our Lord's body is placed in the holy sepulcher, it is the high priest giving his body for his bride, giving his body to his bride. So what are what is the implications of this? John reveals Jesus as our spiritual bridegroom. And we are called to respond in love to Jesus. Do we respond generously to his thirst? Do we give him the fine wine of our greatest love? Or do we give him our leftovers, our uh, wine vinegar, and then just a little bit to moisten his lips. What kind of love do we respond to Jesus with? Jesus gives his body to his bride in a way that brings no pleasure or consolation to himself, a perfect self-gift without any mixture of self-interest. And this is the deeper meaning of celibacy as our priests are conformed to Christ and each priest gives himself as a bridegroom for the bride, which is the church, in this completely selfless way, just as Jesus did. And so just as those, uh, just as Jesus did, just as Jesus gave his body so that the sacraments could flow from his body in the form of water and blood, so those in holy orders sacrifice their bodies for the sacraments to flow from their hands to the bride, which is the church. And for those of us in holy matrimony, we are called to give ourselves in love to the point of death to our spouse, even if it means the cross for us. Our love for our spouse has to be faithful to death because only then does it image the love of Christ his spousal love for his people, his spousal love for us, which is faithful to death. Let's go to him in prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are thankful and overwhelmed at the depths of Christ's love showed to us on Calvary. Lord, Please work in our hearts that we may be more open to your Holy Spirit and more generous, especially in this Lenten season, to the love which Jesus has shown to us. We ask this through Christ our Lord and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some resources that are available. Uh, the material that I've been drawing on this morning, well, actually, uh, both the talks which I've been sharing with you today, as well as a third talk that goes into uh, the gospel accounts of Easter Sunday morning, is available on CD or MP3 in a set called The Triduum Through Jewish Eyes. Um, I've also been drawing on my book, uh, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have a few copies of that here. And uh, my newest book, uh, Jesus and the Old Testament Roots of the Priesthood. This is not a book just for priests. This is actually primarily for lay people. This is a book to help Catholic lady understand what's the role of the priest, but especially what's my priestly role. Because according to Catholic doctrine, all of us are united to Christ's priesthood by our baptism. What does that mean? The catechism calls it our royal priesthood. Does that have any practical bearing on my daily life? I, I argue it does. But anyway, we go into that in depth uh, in, this, uh, in this book. 
Um, also, I've been drawing a lot from the Gospel of John. I've got a complete 30-hour uh, course on the Gospel of John. If you'd like to delve uh, into John at a college level. Um, let me also mention another work that we have here today. Uh, this is a Catholic introduction to the Bible, Old Testament. Um, it's got a treatment of every Old Testament book from a Catholic perspective uh, in it. So if you're studying the Old Testament, sometimes be fuddled by what's going on there. You might want to pick this up as a, as a reference work uh, to, uh, to assist you with, it, with that. So thank you very much uh, for hosting me in Jacksonville. This has been a delight. It's always good to be in the Sunshine State. And uh, Ken Baldwin's going to come. I think we're going to raffle off some goodies. It's always funny. The uh, convert always has the really good Bible talks, and the cradle Catholic runs the raffle at the end. So um, I was just going to say, my wife and I were so excited to give birth to our sixth baby, little Daniel, right before Christmas. And when I read this uh, Old Testament Roots of the Priesthood, it, um, it does talk about lady making their own sacrifices. And so when I'm changing the dirty diapers and waking up at 3 a.m. to get them back to sleep, it's a really been a great reminder. All right, so we're going to raffle off um, a few items here. And I just want to say thank you again for your support and for joining us this morning. And uh, I, I knew it was going to be amazing, and it was. And then as soon as we're done here, John's going to be in the North X signing books for you. So this is fantastic. All right, here we go. The first item is going to be a value of um, $100 is our Genesis to Jesus Journey Through Scripture study. So this will take you through the Old Testament. It's going to blow your mind. And even though you're spending the study 80% in the Old Testament, when you're done with it, you're, not going to, you're just going to want to receive the Eucharist so badly. It's just so powerful. And Robin Pryor from St. John's just won that. Robin, are you here? Yes. Okay. We have, okay, this workbook is to our Parousia Bible and Mass. So when you all go home and you're like, we remember Ken said to download the mobile app and go to stpaulcenter.com to get the studies. This is streaming right now. I think we're on lesson five, six, seven, and eight. So dive right in and then around Holy Week, we're going to make all the episodes free so everybody can watch them. They're free right now, but they're, we're moving people forward so the procrastinators don't fall behind. Okay, here we go. And winning this Parousia workbook is John and Pat, our congressman. <laughs> John and Pat Rutherford. All right. Fantastic. And last but not least, a copy of John's new book, which you can and should get signed right now. Barbara Moore. Is Barbara here? All right, Barbara. Okay. All right. God bless you. On behalf of Dr. Hahn, our entire team, we've got now over 35 staff. We just want to say thank you. Join us in the back for um, some book signs and fellowship. Let's just close a quick prayer in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for dying for us. Lord, if we were the only person on earth, you would still have died for us on the cross. We give you this day. We give you our lives. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all, and we'll hope to see you again soon.